Hey everybody, Ryan from MyKidCuresCancer.com. I am here with Dr. Paul Anderson, who we actually uh, initially saw in Seattle, right post-diagnosis, so this is a real treat for me. Uh, Dr. Anderson, do you want to tell everyone a bit about your practice and what you do in the health space? Sure. So in Seattle, as was mentioned, uh, our clinic is uh, called Advanced Medical Therapies. We're in North Seattle and we focus on the care of uh, advanced cancer cases and then advanced chronic illness. So those are our two areas of focus. And uh, we've been doing that for um, a little over 20 years now, but uh, about 10 of them in Seattle. So you just gave a very long and very brainy talk on cancer <laughs> <laughs> as it applies to genetics and epigenetics which uh, you know it was it was so long and so brainy that it must be right um, but uh, you know for for those of us researching cancer for ourselves or a loved one you start clicking around and all of a sudden you hear that no the, the genetics is wrong it's actually some you know a, a disease of the mitochondria the metabolism no, it's actually uh, you know microbes inside the cells. Then you got the the trophoblast that we heard about yesterday, and, and so on and so forth. Where do you, how do you think about all that in the big picture uh, as yeah. it relates to one versus the other? Yeah, it's. I think that that's probably, and and this is not just for patients; it's for doctors too. It becomes the most confusing part because every. And you can consider them all different theories of the causation of cancer or aggravation of cancer. They all make sense on one level. And one of the things, and of course, what I was just talking about was the genomic influences, which are, you know, 10 years ago, we didn't know much about them. Now we know a lot, but we don't really know everything. I think that what we get in trouble with is if we get too attached to one theory of cancer. Cancer is so um, polyfactorial that um, it, for instance, can be a metabolic problem and then later it can actually switch metabolism and become not a metabolic problem anymore. It's, it's, it's what cancer does. And so one of the things uh, that I brought up in the talk was the new targeted therapies are great, but they only target little places um, and so they'll work for a while, but there's all these other little places that aren't being taken care of, so the cancer morphs and becomes harder to deal with. So I think when it comes to, is, there, is it the genomic thing, trophoblast thing, is it uh, metabolic, is it uh, microbial, immunologic, everybody is probably a little bit right. And I think that because uh, cancer, if you look at it across uh, all patients, you get some people where it's probably pretty more obvious that it could be genetic and genomic where they've had a toxic exposure and then that turned on some genes, et cetera. Or maybe they were born with certain genes and at, after about 20 or 30 years of life, those got turned on like some of the breast cancer, ovarian cancer genes. But then there's some where there's just no rhyme or reason for it at all. And so, and then you have to start looking and saying, well, what, what matters to me the most, although I, I do research and I teach, what matters the most to me is what the patient needs. And that often is, I, I'm less worried about which theory is right and more worried about which part of the theory they need right now. It applies to them. <laughs> yeah. And how do you do that investigative work? What, what yeah. questions go into um, finding that out? You know, I think that if you look overall, um, I think the, like the metabolic theory idea is we'll often start there with patients and do therapeutic trials with them with different uh, dietary changes, et cetera. A lot of times that'll work, but if you only do that, what I've seen, because I've done it a long time, is if you only attack the metabolism, eventually the cancer even figures a way out around that. Then there's other times where you get somebody who um, very seemingly clearly has this long history of a lot of chronic infections that were never treated well, and you can test for those things. And yeah, they may have a metabolic cancer driver, but they have this giant immunologic problem, which is all these infections they're carrying around. Yeah. And one thing I would say that we're learning more over time is when we get people who are uh, lower stage cancers and they're clear of their cancer, you know, they have no evidence of disease because the treatment work, they'll come to us for prevention. And so far we've not found a single one of them that doesn't have at least one or two, if not many chronic infections. 
So I think that the, yeah, you know, so the infections aggravate the genes, they also aggravate the metabolism in your immune system. So I think it's kind of a soup of causes and it's, it depends on what, you know, what poison is for that one person really. Do you have any thoughts of that as applies to uh, childhood cancer? Is it, is it going to be more of a genetic thing? I mean, that's, that's always been something that bugs me since, you know, my, my son was born with it. Um, but, then, but then on the other side, it's like, you know, he, it's not like he's been smoking a pack of days. Right, since, you know. right. There's, there's not, yeah. You know, I think, uh, and as you know, the, one of the most frustrating things um, really are childhood cancers because they don't tend to make a lot of sense. And um, there, there are some where there's very clear genes and if you, it's a very rare gene, but if you happen to be born with it, you're gonna have some kind of cancer. But then there's a lot where that's probably not that clear, if at all. And then, you know, there are, there's research going on into, you know, you could have triggered the gene to be, turned on two generations ago and it just finally works its way out, you know out yeah and it's and, and there's there's gene things we don't know about even so maybe um, but but uh, as, as you know we we see a lot of children and I would say in about three quarters of the cases there's not a clear pathway as to how in the world did this happen you yeah know, it's not a it's at least we don't know it right now so then it's just a matter and that makes it very frustrating because there's you know um, you know, no child should be born with cancer, but many are. And I, and I think that, and I haven't looked at the statistics for quite a long time, but I think, as we see with overall cancers, the incidence of childhood cancer has gone up quite a bit with the incidence of a lot of these other damaging, you know, toxins and yeah. a lot of other things. When it comes to cancer in general, are there, you know, you just talk, talked a lot about specific targeted therapies and, and so on and so forth. Um, are there any treatments, or, with the exception of, you know, general healthy lifestyle changes, <laughs> are there any uh, treatments or supplements you end up, you know, recommending across the board, no matter what the, mm -hmm. the person or cancer is? You know, I think, um, and kind of going back to the theory that even if you have a targeted therapy, they work better if you're covering all the other targets. <laughs> um, and things from the, the plant world do that better than anything. What we're learning, I think, too, is, is that uh, just like you can't only treat something metabolically because eventually the cancer works its way because you're not covering any other bases, if you put people on, say, one herbal thing just forever and ever, unless it's a really multifactorial thing and that's all they get, they, the cancer will figure that out too. Yeah. So what we tend to do now, which I, is a learning process, is the in the talk I just gave, a, I brought up a really nice paper about polyphenols. So the family that quercetin and curcumin and uh, artichoke and you know EGC, all that stuff is in. Those are really hard to beat because they're so broadly affecting, and so you can use them longer. But what we tend to tell people to do is start with let's say curcumin or quercetin and in three to six months we're going to do something different for a while just it's a little different yeah. uh, so that's one thing we give melatonin in many many cancers um, we give low dose naltrexone in many many cancers oh, not all it's nothing we give probably in everybody but yeah, yeah. those are pretty broad yeah. Melatonin in particular, it's always been my concern of, of uh, you know, creating some sort of addiction. Is that, uh, you know, with, yeah. with the body not producing it on its own, is that just it's taken care of with cycling on and off sort of um, thing? Or? It's, it's something, and of course in, I'll speak about adults for a moment, because in children it's a different story, but um, in adults, um, our, our, our theory has been if they have cancer, then we give higher doses than you would normally give for sleep or whatever. Yeah. But it's being given kind of like you give higher doses of curcumin than you would for joint pain because you're trying to modify the disease. Um, honestly, what we tend to see is even people on you know, 20, 30, 40 milligrams, which is a lot more melatonin than you make every day, you can ramp them off and they'll go back to making melatonin again, unless they just didn't make it before. Yeah. But yes, because it's, it is a hormone, um, you do have to factor that in. What we, um, what we often do is, uh, if we get the person and the disease is active and then it kind of calms down, 
we'll try and either take them off or ramp them down on most of the things that they're doing too, just so the dosing's easier. Yeah. Yeah, our rotation has been uh, has been more and more on my mind lately. Yeah. Just about it's, keeping things yeah. Uh, yeah. keeping things interesting. <laughs> yeah, and I, I think uh, if you you know if you look and if if you talk to anybody who's seen cancer patients a long time. I have, for example, on the like the metabolic approach, I had a lady who had advanced breast cancer. She didn't want to do anything, uh, but she did keto diet and all the metabolic stuff, and she actually kept it from advancing for about eight years, and then it just kind of went like a freight train because it figured out a way around it. Yeah, and there was you know there's nothing else going on. So it's cases like that that made me a believer, and we um, that's great if that's working, but let's just keep the other fires calm, <laughs> calm too. <laughs> Did you have something else to say about melatonin with children, or? Oh, in uh, so we have and we have used it in children, in in growing brains and growing you know hormonal systems. You have to be a little more careful, and so we tend to use lower doses if we do use it, and it, it's sort of body weight adjusted, really. Yeah, but the other thing is sometimes you get a benefit, and you don't have to go to a super high dose, and that's what we try to do with kids. Last question, if you had to take everything you know, which apparently is a lot, and boil it down to three golden rules on how to stay healthy and disease free, what would those rules be? Mm. Um, and I, I would say either someone who's never had cancer or somebody who's in a recovery or a remission from cancer, it's kind of the same rules seemingly. Um, I think the first thing is whatever goes into your body, and that would include the air you breathe and everything, you have, water you drink, everything else, is as pure as it can be. And there's there's no way in this world that everything's pure. But you can take steps to eat organic food and have filtered water. And and like in our uh, house and our clinic, we have uh, air filters, you know, for that purpose as well. So I think as much cleaning of uh, things before they go into your body, that's great. Then I really think that, um, and I sort of spoke to this in the talk a little bit, once you're at like remission or recovery or prevention, it's all about balance nutritionally. So you, unless you have a certain genetic defect or whatever, you don't need a lot of any one thing, you need a lot of all the good stuff. Yeah. And that usually we try and have people do that from clean diet sources, you know. So that's another one. So clean going in and then balance. Um, and then I think the third one really is, uh, and since I only get one more, I'm gonna just lump them together. Um, but, because they do go together. Sure. So the, the mental game and the, and the emotional game. Um, I've seen more people where when, when they physically and mentally emotionally slip, their immune system just can't keep up because they're not, you know, they're not staying focused and positive and in, engaged in outcomes not not that they're ignoring things you know or saying oh, I, don't, I, I don't need to worry yeah but they're staying you know positively focused on staying healthy and I think that's huge dr. Anderson thanks for the time thank you